On today's episode of Gathering the Kings. Was there an ego check moment or was it just like the pain was just so bad where you're just like, okay, I'm not going to lose all my money. Well, I am going to lose all. I'm going to give it to this guy and hopefully he can help me get there. What was that moment? What's up, everybody? Chaz Wolf, Gathering the Kings podcast. I got Michael McLeish on the King stage today. My brother, how are you? Doing great, man. Thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure to have you on. Thank you for being here. And, you know, we were just reminiscing before the show started of your, your beard, but you're growing it back. And so not to, not to be worried, it's coming. But you had this Zoom picture that popped up here that I was like, oh, man, my, my bearded brother. But, <laughs> but you're growing it back. So I just am I'm thankful, beard or no beard, I'm thankful for you to be here. <laughs> well, good. I'm glad to be accepted either way. Yeah. So <laughs> we, we don't make any discriminatory marks here, beard or no beard. But in all seriousness, Michael, what kind of business do you have? What are we going to be chatting about? Yeah, so my, my primary business is wholesaling real estate. And for those of you who don't know what that means, it's, it's basically a sales and marketing company and solving people problems, the vehicle of, of single family homes. And so to dive in a little deeper, what that means is we will market to homeowners that have a distressed property or maybe a distressed situation. And there's some analogies like a pawn shop, right? You know, somebody pulling something, they don't expect full value, but they need some money quick. And so the model really follows that. We mark for those types of people that actually are helped through selling their home and getting a speedy and convenient outcome from that. So from there, once we have an agreement to buy a property at a discount, we now have the option of buying it, keeping it as a rental, doing the traditional jo Joanna fix flip, making it look all pretty and selling at retail, or we can sell the deal. We can sell the contract or the rights to buy the property to a third party. And so that's probably the primary exit strategy, but we do look at all three for everything. Love that. Love that. And, and there's, there's, a, there's value in each of those exit strategies. And so maybe we'll get into some of that a, a little bit, but I want to know at this level, you know, you've got multiple different exit strategies. You've got a team. You, you've been doing this. You're successful. You're about to start a podcast. Why at this level do you push? Like, why are you, why are you still motivated? Why are you still after it? What's the bigger picture for you? Well, I don't know. I just, it, it's, I'm just not satisfied. And I feel like I'm in my infancy stage a lot of ways. And I'm just getting started. And I really, you know, quite honestly, didn't get into the real estate space to be a real estate guy. It was just the path I took to get me really, frankly, to not be broke. And, yeah, uh, you know, just as a quick aside, like I got into the business again with like this idea of financial freedom, but all I knew was don't be broke. So that was really the mantra for the first few years. Right. And then you... You know, we did pretty well for the first few years. And then it was like, okay, really, where am I headed with this? What's, what's my purpose? Yeah, some of that's still getting sorted out. So I want to, you know, continue to grow the company and make it better. But at the same time, use that as a tool, as a, as a jumping point for the next venture, whatever that might look like. Yeah, I love it. I love what you said that you believe that you're, you know, in the infancy, just getting started. I think there's a certain level of, not only excitement that entrepreneurs carry with them, an optimistic hope, something better, something that's down the road, a future, something different, if you will. But I love what you said of just feeling like you're just getting off, especially at the level that you carry. It was like, okay, so I've been successful and I feel this way as well. It's like, man, I, I feel like we're just getting rolling. Like, I feel like we're just kind of just getting the momentum, which it, it, it is a direct like battle with average. Right. Cause at, at a certain level, average thinks I made it, you know? And so what's your mindset there around? Like, obviously what you're doing is not average, but was this mindset that was built out over time? Like, did, like, was this established by a mentor? Like, how did you come to believe this? Oh man, that's a, that's such a great question. I, I think just deep down normal makes my stomach turn. Average makes my stomach turn. Like, I just, I don't want to do that. I don't, I, and for whatever reason. I just always knew I was going to fight that, right? And trying to articulate that a little bit better and give you some examples, you know, you're, so here's, here's just a, a weird quirk of mine, but 
years ago, I was trying, I was in the Air Force. I was active duty at the time and I was trying to figure out like this whole fitness thing because clearly the Air Force's model was not going to, you know, their test wasn't going to get shape. It was game the system and, and the pass the test. Right. And I knew I wanted to be in like some incredible level of fitness and I tried all these things. I was getting injured. I wasn't getting great results. And a coworker of mine, this is like 2005 era here. And a coworker of mine who was in his late forties, you know, he was like, man, I'm doing this CrossFit thing, you know? And I was like, that sounds dumb. You know, like who would do hundred reps of anything and do it fast. He's like, man, just give it a try. And I, you know, I watched a few videos and there wasn't much content in the world of CrossFit then. Right. And I was like, whatever these girls are smoking, I want some of that. So I went all in and bought a whole bunch of equipment that was hard to find, started doing it. And it was so not normal right? that in my own mind, I just made it work. And I embraced that for several years that just, this isn't normal, this works. And I can yeah. say the same thing as far as, you know, my, my spiritual beliefs are probably not normal compared to most of the world, but yeah. I'm drawn to it because of, because the yeah. one says, no, that's, that's silly. That's not normal. Yeah. That's a so. really good perspective because I think that a lot of people listening at least to a degree in the entrepreneurial world, right? Where there's a little bit of a chip on our shoulder. We think a little different. We're a disruptor. We challenge things. We ask questions when we shouldn't, you know, like, like there's always this, this back and forth. I think that the principle of what you're describing causes in, in us as entrepreneurs, that's why we, that's why we run a business. We like to solve problems. We like to you know, attack new challenges. And so I, I love the perspective. It, I, it fires me up just to know that there's another person out there that's as crazy as I am about, you know, trying new things or being challenged by maybe status quo and going, no, yeah. just, just no. Yeah. I mean, it's like when your doctor's like, you go to your doctor and you're like, well, I got a stomach ache and, you know, my heart's kind of doesn't feel right. Because while well, you're out of shape and, and, you know, might have some heart issues. But don't worry, it's normal. Like, right. No, I'm better than that. Exactly. So, yeah, I gotta gotta hurry up quick and throw on the brakes when average or normal those words. It's like no, you gotta gotta run far away from that. Okay, let's let's use this to parlay into your into your story. Like, how did you get into real estate, or was there a business before that? Was entrepreneurialism in your family? How did how did you come to be? Oh, yeah, that's great. I didn't realize it, but I actually grew up in an entrepreneurial family. But we we were on a family farm in North Dakota. My dad was an entrepreneur. Exactly. Yeah, of course. It, did, it didn't occur to me until I was like mid thirties that farming is an entrepreneurial venture. Um, yeah, but what's interesting about that is my dad's generation, you know, really came from like find a great job, work that career, you know, work it to the top. My mom is a right. perfect example of that. She and a perfect example of why that might not work anymore. She worked for um, TWA Airlines, oh, wow. and that all went sideways. And she got ultimately furloughed for a while, then went to American, and then. They just said, yeah, thanks, but now you're the bottom rung after 30 years of flying and we're just going to yeah, let you go. Exactly. And so I saw, you know, what dad was saying and what their generation was saying was what you should do. That was a little bit ingrained in me and he struggled like, mentally with the farming end of things. It was a, it was a few years in the eighties, so uh, far oh, yeah. climate. So, so I just went down the, like, I'm going to work my butt off at school. I'm going to get the best grades possible. I'm going to be top of the class, graduate with honors, which I did in high school and college and went active to be in the Air Force. And wow. uh, it wasn't long, though, into that real career when just something was bothering. It just didn't feel right. You know, I, was, I didn't like that. A lot of my roles just were like, I was just a seat for And I was like, this is not, right. this is not what my life is all about. Fast forward a few years, you know, I did get out of the Air Force. And I was like, what am I going to do? Nothing really gets excited. I don't really want to do this kind of work. I was an engineer training and I started my first company, CrossFit. Again, I didn't expect talking about that so much today, but that was my first business. We started what was then CrossFit on coast. And there was, I don't know, I, I want to say there was less than 500 CrossFit affiliate gyms at that time. Like we were pretty wow. new to that area and, and it was great. But again, this was 2005, 2006. And handle it was not the best economy. We never took distribution out of the business, and you know, I got married, and my wife's like, "Hey, honey, we we actually need some here. We actually need to, to live. So. Can I can I eat? Can I go to the grocery yeah. store? 
<laughs> so I, I, my first business really in a lot of ways, I hate to use the word failure, but it, it didn't pan out it's free and you know, all these things. Right. And I went back to work for the, the band. I worked for the government as a civil servant for another several few years. And really the, what shook me from that was my first son was born. And there's a picture of me. He was three weeks old. We flew to California to my in-laws. I'm taking a nap with my arm around him. Right next to the pillow is Rich Dad. So I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. Yeah. That was really the catalyst because I was seeking like financial freedom. I wanted that. I started to read books about it. And that really started the juices flowing. As soon as we got back to Colorado, we were living in Colorado Springs at the time also. I went to a investing club. And just like, what's this all about? I got to, yeah. and that's where I learned the concept of wholesaling and uh, boy, lots of water under the bridge. I finally, you know, went full time in the fall of 2016. Is that right? Wow. Yeah. Um, so that's a whole other crazy story I can tell you. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, obviously the, the journey to get there, I love how you pointed out to your, that your dad, you know, being a farm, you growing up in that environment is a whole lot more entrepreneurial than than a lot of times people see, but man, you want to talk about the tough of the tough, like the original entrepreneurs, you know, you, yeah. you grow this, I grow that. And we swap, I mean, even before your dad, even, you know, so I just, I just appreciate that journey. I want to know now that like, obviously you kind of transitioned into this. You said you went full-time in 2016. What was that tipping point for you at that time to go full-time? And then I want you to parlay it right into, did that make a difference? Like, was it an all in mindset or was like to where you are now? Yeah. Oh man. So these were the craziest times and the biggest act of faith that I think I've pulled off in my life because for me, where I was mentally at that time, it was a humongous, what I thought was a humongous risk. And now I, I just, why didn't it sooner? That was what yeah. I think. So what that looked like though was I'm trying to think 2014. I think mid-year, I, I did my first wholesale deal. Okay. It was a messy, ugly, drawn-out deal. And then I did another one, one or two, you know, shortly after that. And it was like one to three deals a year. And I was working full-time. I actually took a different job within the civil service that allowed me, as long as I did my core job, I could work from home and telework the rest of the time and be on call. Yeah. And, and so I took that with the mindset of, okay, if I'm not absolutely needed, at work, I've accomplished what, you know, I need to do. I can use that extra time to work on building this business. Yeah. So it was a little bit of a, you know, four hour work. But at the same time, I was not getting a lot of traction. I don't think I believed in myself enough. So I put a lot of work, but it wasn't necessarily the most productive. I did a handful of deals. I tried another methodology of remote wholesaling. I was flipping houses in Tampa when I lived in Denver at the time. Yeah. And you know, one day though, really the tip point was my wife came to me and said, we've got our, our three-year-old, we've got a baby on the way and you need to work full-time and love it, or you need to quit it and go real estate full-time and you don't get to do both because I was, I was up at four in the morning and I was in bed at 10, 11 o'clock at night, just yeah. absent. Yeah. So my wife really was the catalyst, to, you know, throw me off the cliff. And let's go. So I said, look, if you've got my back, you trust me, you've got proof of concept. I believe in this. Let's go. So here's where it got crazy is we put our house on the market and we're in Littleton, Colorado, and we didn't could afford to stay there. I, I didn't have any cash, like any liquid cash to live on, much less do marketing. So we had to move. So I had $100,000 in equity in the house. So we put the house up for sale and we, you know, so where should we move? Well, we need somewhere a little less expensive to live. We have some friends in Greenville, South Carolina that said we should visit. Let's just look online. The market looks pretty good in real estate. Let's just move there. Kim's like, wow. I can wear sandals most of the year. Let's do it. <laughs> so I'd never been there, never had been there. And we put a house under contract, flew out there to do the inspection with it. And all checked out and it was go time. We sold our house. I quit my career. Yeah. I fired my boss and wow. we bought a house across the country and started a new business in a market that I've never been in before, all yeah. in about uh, 120 days. Wow. So that was the leap of faith, the burn the ships moment that 
was scary, but I don't know that me personally, I could have done it any other way because it forced my hand. Like now it's up to me. There's no help. There's no safety net. There's no, you know, like in government service, you can go big and not lose your job. Right. So for me, that was, that was tremendous. And that was really the, like, the moment was like, I'm all in. Yeah. The, the catalyst really, I loved how you described the, the, the moments there. A lot of uncertainty, a lot of, I loved how you said, do you, do you trust me? Do you like, will you support me through this, this craziness? And you're not the first person, you know, to be on the show, even in my own story, I can point to Julie, my wife and both things that you said, number one, her challenging me going, Hey champ, I need you to be involved in the family. <laughs> number two is I trust you. I, I know that if you just, if you'll just go for it, we're here, like we'll cheer you on and, and, and we believe in you. And that sounds, it sounds so simple, but, but to your point, to my point here, it's like, man, that was all the fuel that I even had. It's all that I needed for at least that period of time. I could have driven for miles and miles and miles on that fuel. And I still, I try to tell her today, I'm like, look, all you got to do is tell me like, not like how great I am, but like, man, I, thank you. I appreciate it. Like, I love you. I, we, we, we believe in you for me. I don't, maybe you can resonate with this, but that'll just fill up the tank yeah, for, for weeks 100%. and weeks and week. You know, it, you know, I, I, Kim and I had a talk just a few months ago about you know, that season and, and I was like, did you have any, like, I was like, I was so scared and, and we were this close to like daddy going to work for McDonald's and, you know, like it was that first year was rough and she's like, she goes, I trusted you and I didn't worry about money because you, you know, I'd be, and I was yeah. like, holy, you know, like that was, that was just everything. Big. Yeah. I love that. Okay, let's let's get tactical here. Tell me about a good decision. So you moved to South Carolina. You've never been there. You're brand new. You've done a couple of wholesales. There's a proof of concept. You're you you have the trust of your family. Give me a good decision that you made once moving there that you can look back on and that that decision that you can share here today that's like not maybe the exact reason why you're successful, but it was a huge part of it. Yeah. What comes to mind there, and I think this is the most appropriate answer for that is, well, I'll give you a little backstory to this in that I was boots on the ground, I think October 1st, and, you know, it took us a month to unpack the thing and, and kind of get the lay of the land and all that. And, uh, you know, November, I started marketing and I had taken all these different like guru courses and I was trying to mix and match. And I was trying to do all these different things and spread a wide net. Yeah. And by the end of January of that next year, I was like, I don't even have like a solid lead. Like, wow. you know, I'm on, I'm, I'm just arranging deck chairs on the Titanic. Like I wow. really was feeling like, I don't know where I'm going. I didn't have that much money. I mean, I, I probably told myself I had less than I really had, but it, okay. I could see it draining every month without it. And so. What I did was I, I, there was actually, again, give credit to podcasting. There was a podcast I was listening to and I, and I knew some of these people that were getting these results from this coach and I'm like, that is incredible. And so I, I finally came to the point of like, I can figure it out myself, maybe, right. yeah. or I hire the best person I can afford, maybe yeah. not even afford, but I'm going to hire him anyway. And I'm going to go down with the best arsenal of tools I can have. Yeah. Right. So I was like. You know, let's go for it. So I hired him. So I'll give credit. I mean, this is Tom Kroll with Wholesaling Inc. And Tom has since sold the company, but he was my coach. So again, the, so the answer, the short answer is hiring a coach yeah. that knows how to get you from point A to B the most efficiently. Yeah. He was able to give you the blueprints and then obviously underneath that being coachable and just having a desire. What do you think? So for the person listening right now, I can, I'm trying to relate this to my own story as well. What I have found the difficulty in doing what you just said that you did is maybe the pain isn't great enough, right? Like we're pretty sharp guys, even though the business isn't like super big yet, you know, we're going back years, you know, it's like, ah, uh, you know, how, how can I, how can I really learn from that guy? Or maybe I can do it on my own. You understand what I'm saying? Like a little bit of ego, yeah. right? Like yeah. so, did something happen for you or was there an ego check moment or was it just like the pain was just so bad where you're just like, okay. I'm not going to lose all my money. Well, I am going to lose all. I'm going to give it to this guy and hopefully he can help me get there. What was that moment? Hey, Chaz Wolf here. As many of you know, I have been on an absolute mission to help entrepreneurs from all across the country in many different industries level up their game and grow their business and intentionally connect with other entrepreneurs. We do that obviously through the podcast, but we also 
have a peer-to-peer mastermind group specifically for seven to nine figure business owners. We are bringing some of the best and most successful entrepreneurs and minds together in a regular and super intentional way to not only grow our network, but to be able to leverage. And at a certain point in business, success becomes about leverage, leveraging time, leveraging resources, leveraging key relationships. This is exactly what we're doing inside of the peer-to-peer mastermind group called Gathering the Kings, specifically for seven to nine figure business owners. So if that's you, if you're ready to level up your seven to nine figure business even to the next level and get around other big hitters just like you, I want you to go to gatheringthekings.com, fill out a short application, and uh, it'll come to an application uh, call with me, and I want to chat with you to see if it might be a good fit. Talk soon. Yeah. Oh, man, I don't know how to answer that. It was kind of a blessing and a curse because there's a lot of people that will say, you don't need to hire a coach. Everything's on YouTube. All the information in this day and age is out there. Just go do it, right? Yeah. And that works for some people. I'm just not one of them. I I honestly think one of my earlier flaws in life was I I needed somebody in my corner and I needed somebody to validate and keep me on track. And as I mean, even mature entrepreneurs, if you can say such a thing, love the shiny objects. I want some of this, some of this, some of this, some of this. They really need somebody in their life to say, pick one path, master it before you do the next thing. And I recognize that in myself of one, maybe not the validation piece, but I do need a path. Like instead of reinventing the wheel myself, I don't, yeah. I don't need that ego boost. I just don't want to probe. Yeah. Yeah. Well, cause so. what we're talking about is a greater or lesser desire. Your desire to not be broke was greater than your ego in that moment of figuring yeah, it out on 100%. your own. Okay, yeah. good. What about a bad choice? Let's flip the coin here. What did you what did you do? What was the what was the the dirty moment? Hmm. Well, what I was thinking was is actually the opposite of that was what led me to that precipice of like I've gotta gotta spend more money, put it on my credit card than I have because I'm trying to do everything. I'm trying to take this guru's idea on you know, for example, like wholesaling lease options. And I'm going to do creative financing here. And I took a course on how to buy houses subject to the existing financing, meaning right. I'm buying somebody else's house and keeping their name on the loan. And there's a billion ways to skip the cat. Again, I just was trying to do all of it. And I guess where I didn't quite learn that lesson early on was in Mark, I tried, you know, I'm going to do a little direct mail, I'm going to do a little cold calling, I'm going to throw out some bandit signs. I'm going to, you know, whatever. I'm going to, I'm going to go spend an hour in front of the grocery store talking to people, you know, like right. trying to do all these different marketing strategies, but not one single marketing strategy was consistent or dialed in. And so I think where I was wrong, again, just the inconsistency in coaching, inconsistency in exit strategies, inconsistency in marketing, all those things were just the perfect storms of failure. Yeah. And, yeah. and I, you know, fortunately caught it for it yeah, bottom up. yeah I, I think every entrepreneur goes through this i have you know even even a partner of mine in one of my real estate companies you know we we've got a little bit of a delay on his specific focus on the business just due to other projects that need to get done first and his immediate thought was okay great well no worries i'll go i'll go do this other thing over here that will just allow me to be self-sustaining he was just thinking partner i don't want to be a burden while this piece is not good but the reality of it is, is that he could jump in over here and keep us all like dialed in and focused. I know that's kind of a, a, like a little bit of a secure example, but what you're saying is that, you know, don't reach for the shiny objects, although it's super exciting. We hear this over and over and over again, but this is yeah. a live example of, okay, not only just the idea, your product. So you already even said that at the beginning, you said, I can do all these exit strategies, but mostly I do one, Right. And, yep. and then now even in your marketing. So do you, do you find in, like one channel of marketing has really been your go-to more than others? It's, it's flip-flopped around, but, sure. and, and I guess that's what, as you kind of grow and, and mature in your marketing strategies, they're like, well, I can tell from the real estate perspective of what I've done. Um, I started, so this is where the coach stepped in. I actually, some history I was doing, he's like, just do direct mail. going to only do direct mail. And, you know, based on your budget, this is how you should lay it out. So I did that and I just spent all this money on direct mail. And there was actually another moment in there where things went sideways. I wasn't closing. And as a coach, he stepped in and just, and kind of 
I understand now why he did it, but he, he shook me up. He's like, Mike, you're done. Fired from your market and you are going to remote wholesale, pick one of these three markets in other parts of the country. And, and you're now going to be cold calling only. So completely kicked me out yep. of what I was doing, shook it up and said, now you're focused on this and, and you choose this, 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 go. So what was interesting was I had leads from the direct mail and all of a sudden a couple started up and I closed a couple of deals. Yep. And I said, look, I accidentally just closed a couple of deals. Do I need to still shift markets? He goes, nope, you now believe that it works, right? And I was like, I do. You know, so. It was a magic moment there, but I had already shifted into cold calling. So he's like, yeah. so I got really good at cold calling and I did that until I was hiring people. Now I can hire cold callers. I think I hired at 1.2 and now the leads were coming in without me doing it. Right. The leads were coming consistently. And now I could look at other marketing options because I didn't worry about that not happening based on my mood or whatever, you know, big thing when entrepreneurs start is they say, well, I've got this much for marketing and they spend it all. And they're like, oh, I'm a little scared. I don't want to spend anymore. The market drops off and yeah. up and they're on this swing. They don't see the results. And so they're constantly chasing results compared to their marketing. So I switched into direct mail, started doing that, getting good at that. And what happened actually in 2020 was we we're still, most of our revenue was from cold calling. 2021, it actually swapped. Direct mail now was king. We were actually producing more revenue from direct mail than cold calling. And that's wow. been consistent. And, you know, so if I even started with direct mail, like right where I'm at now, I have enough leads. I don't need any more. I don't need to add a cold calling system because we, the leads will be wasted. And there's, you know, there's extra overhead managing that, that side yeah. of things. So, yeah. so you max out one and then you're like, okay, I've got overhead. I have a need for more leads. I have a need for more revenue. Now you can add on that next part. Yeah, That's I love I love dialing in like that, what you're saying, and, and not moving on until there's certain either revenue necessity or revenue generation, depending upon what the target of the of the campaign is. Even right before that, you said this, and this has come up recently in the Gathering the Kings Mastermind. You know, we were comparing, you know, how much you spend on marketing and your different businesses across the, you know, not all of them are real estate, of course. And and there's a general range, you know, that you spend. But the question that had come up that you just said is, man if you just play the game of like, okay, things are going well, I want to market more and things are not going well. So I'm going to, I'm going to hold back. Generally speaking, marketing is a consistency game. It's an awareness game. And so you just need to be there all the time, whether times are good or times are bad. And usually it's when times are bad or when, you know, your competitors are retracting and that's when you need to stay consistent, if not double down, which is so difficult in the moment because man, it's like, it's a little scary. It's a little bit unnerving. And, but what I just heard you say is the same thing that we were just discussing, which is like, look, if anything, you just got to stay consistent. You want to add anything yeah. to that? I mean, that's, that's a lesson I keep learning over and over again. Well, this it's an emotional one, right? Like in the moment you're going, yeah. you can see it going down. You're going, yeah, 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 yeah it, it really is. I don't know that I can add. It's again, it's the consistency in your exit strategy, consistency in your niche, your exit strategy, marketing, because you know, everybody's going to come up hey, here's a webinar on this shiny strategy that you need to be implementing today. Right. Oh, that sounds great. And now you you risk consistency in the other, unless it's really dialed in and it happened. I think Joe McCall, I used to listen to him a lot, like marketing should happen for you in spite of you, right? You can get your channel set up so marketing happens for you in spite of you. Now you can look and entertain these other things. Yeah, so, I love that perspective. Yeah. That's good. What process or maybe decision discipline do you have now? We've talked about your good and bad one from the past. How do you process decisions now? I'm trying to, you know, I still feel like a, a baby entrepreneur in a lot of ways and still learning some hard lessons, but I'm trying to now use KPIs and metrics instead of like how I feel about things. And, yeah. you know, maybe I should have said this was my big mistake recently was operating from one bank account and saying, well, I see a big pile of money in there. Why don't we go spend money on this new endeavor? Or right, right. why don't I take a big distribution out and buy you know, this, this thing that I want for my personal life? And what I've learned over just this last year is really being consistent, putting things into this, like well, profit first really spoke yep. to me. So I went at that. And again, that's just helped me be more consistent in 
go, this much money always goes just to these pots. Yeah. And now I can make decisions based on what's in my operating expense account versus my gut feeling behind it. Because eventually you get big enough guts wrong um, because yeah. there's just yeah. too many pieces to keep track of. Exactly. And so now, you know, I can use more data. It's Mark Evans, my mentor says more data, not drama, right? So right. now I can make decisions based on KPIs, based on the correct bank account and go from there. So again, just being more methodical behind how we process things. Love it. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and switch over to the speed round here. My first question so, to you is dwindling the entire business down. If you could only pick one metric to track forever and ever, what would you choose? Oof, that is such a, a good question. I don't know how well this would work, but if I had to pick one, I would say meaningful conversations. Okay, yeah. Because, you know, in my industry, it's sales and marketing. And so there's a lot of variables that go into that. Don't spend any marketing. You're probably not going to have any leads. But right. at the end of the day, what you're looking for is how many people are we talking to in a meaningful way. So for us, meaningful conversations is for a seller lead is, are we moving forward together and what's the next step? Or yeah. are we not? A, right. It's very clear. It's concise. And we know one way or the other, had that conversation or her. And so from a high level, you know, if you've got a certain number of those, the business is either on track to hit targets or behind measurement, something like that, right? Yep. The more people you talk to, the the luckier you get. <laughs> I love that. Yep. Okay. What book would you recommend that a six-figure business owner read, Michael? Oh, man. What book? You, you mentioned Profit First. You mentioned, you know, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Anything, anything yeah. other than that? Oh, man. I think this is probably one of my favorite books that comes up a lot in conversations. And it's called Die With Zero. I don't know if you've read that one. And I have, all of a sudden, the, the author is escaping my, my brain okay. here. We'll, we'll look it up and but, put it in the show notes. Yeah, it's an amazing book. I think a high-level entrepreneur should read it. And I think a high school graduate should read it. And it probably ever hear That's awesome. because it really helps you prioritize what all the standards that you're putting into a business is for, using it at the appropriate time in your life for what serves you. So yeah. I, I think that's a, that was great. And give me the title. Well, <clears throat> excuse me, give me a title one more time. It's called Die With Zero. Die With Zero. Perfect. Okay. You've already mentioned, you know, coaches. You've mentioned, I can't remember if it was on the show or before we got started, a mastermind group that you're a part of. My question normally is, what do you think about intentionally networking or masterminding? But I'm going to twist it a little, little bit since I already obviously know that you do these things and find value in them. What would you say to the listener today who maybe doesn't do those things yet, maybe knows that he or she should, or maybe doesn't know that he or she should? What would you what would you say about intentionally networking or masterminding as a, you know, not yet seven figure owner? Oof, that's that's a good one. I think you have to maybe go back a little bit introspective and ask yourself, what if I did network? What am I afraid of? Right? What's my fear that's keeping me if I know this is something I should do? What's the fear? that is really driving that. I mean, if you spend a little time, look on, on YouTube, find like Ferris or TED Talk on fear setting, wonderful exercise to really go back and like, okay, if, if I do this thing and it fails, here's the outcome and here's how I can recover. And what's the odds of that, right? And then what if I do the thing and it's a success, right? What does that look like? And what's the odds of that? And you're going to paint yourself a pretty clear picture of what you should. So I think just, again, really looking at like, what are you looking for? What do you want out of you know this potential opportunity? What are you trying to build or grow? Right. Who has the answer to help you get there? And I mean, I'm, I'm a big believer that you know, we don't, as an entrepreneur, that of a big, any real really successful entrepreneur is standing on the shoulders of giants. They need yeah. people. They need to network with others. They need to build a community to support yeah. them and, and have great people working for them and also great mentors to lift them up. So I think it, it's, and if you're hesitant to do that, it's something you need to take some time and really understand behind it and, and then come to a clear conclusion. Maybe this isn't for me and I need to go and do the other thing and, and you'll know. Yeah. I love that uh, methodical, rational approach. Last question here for you. If you lost it all, Michael, what would you do? Ooh, I think about this sometimes, but. <laughs> Never had been asked directly. I lost it all. Well, this is just really piggy 
backs on your last question. And I still have a network. I mean, you, you can't really lose it all. If I was a prisoner of war, I still have knowledge and lessons learned in my mind, in my brain, in terms of how to interact with people, how to negotiate, like just various different things. But in a more like, I just screwed up and I lost all my money sense, I'd go to my network and say, hey, you know, you and I connected, you know my values, I know yours. This is what I want to do next. Where can we work together? Right? And again, just starting to talk to people. Again, if I'm going to pick my path, just start up the phone, be in the streets, talking to people and using my network to help me magnify the, that effort that I have to do on the day to day. Love it. Uh, Michael, you've been incredible. How can a listener find you? Whether they're in the local area, whether they're, they just want to reach across the country and, and uh, get to know another bearded fellow, what, how can they find you? Yeah, perfect. Probably the easiest place to find me right now on social media is just Michael McLeish Official. And it's the same on Instagram, Michael McLeish Official. Find me there. And my profile sure still has the beard. So if you want to see what Chaz is talking about, get on there. And, and you have a podcast coming out. Tell us, just give us, you know, 15 seconds on the podcast. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, it's called Expanding Boundaries. And it's, I don't really have a set agenda other than sharing my journey of where I've been in terms of, there, there's just been like big monumental mindset shifts. Some are smaller, some are bigger than others as I've grown in this journey. And so I want to share some of those stories. It's going to be largely interfaced, you know, with former mentors, coaches I've worked with, other people in business that had big aha, uh, game-changing mental shifts. And again, my goal is also to have people that I'm looking up to that help me grow and also share in that education, if you will, and help the audience grow. So again, that's, that's what it's all about. I'm really big on travel, camping, particularly outdoors. And we're building this ridiculous sprinter van. So, you know, like the, the whole idea of expanding boundaries and traveling beyond yeah. where, you know, really resonates. With me. So that's, yeah. that, that's all. Well, maybe you'll do the podcast from your, your mobile unit. Oh yeah. Once you, once you have the, the sprinter van ready to roll. Absolutely. Michael, you've been incredible. Your mindset is, is on point. Thank you for sharing your time. Nothing but blessing to you, your family, your new sprinter, expounding boundaries physically, obviously on the podcast as well. But again, just thank you for being here. Okay. Well, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for having me on today. That's a lot yeah. of fun. Thank you for listening to Gathering the Kings today. I hope that you were able to pull out a few nuggets to go apply into your business right away. More importantly, though, I hope that you're realizing that it takes more to be successful than just being by yourself, doing it all on your own, carrying the weight all by yourself. What I have realized, not only in my own journey from multiple businesses and multiple different industries, and now interviewing over two or 300 other very successful seven, eight and nine figure business owners is that it's tough to do it alone. And so Gathering the Kings exists to bring together successful entrepreneurs. In fact, we are putting together 1000 Kings specifically who are grateful, but not done. We're intentionally assembling Kings who fight tooth and nail for their business, family and communities. And here's what we believe that in the pursuit of excellence in those areas, that it ignites within us the responsibility to govern power and forge a lasting legacy. So if that relates and, and resonates with you, and you know that you need people around you, sharp, qualified, other very successful business owners, I want you to go to gatheringthekings.com. I want you to take a look at what we're doing and see if it makes sense for you to be part of our pursuit to 1,000 Kings. Talk soon.